Hello and welcome to another session of uh, AutoSan Nuggets. Uh, today we are looking at AutoSan features of persistent hyperplastic uh, primary vitreous. My name is David. Now, uh, persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous basically is a congenital anomaly which can be detected uh, doing a routine antenatal uh, scan in the third uh, trimester. But in most cases, these are encountered um, uh, after birth within the first few weeks or months uh, in which the, uh, the parents would uh, notice abnormalities. So PHPV, which is also referred to as persistent uh, fetovasculature, is basically a congenital anomaly in which the primary vitreous and the hyaluronic vasculature fail to regress. So this would actually arise uh, during the seventh week of gestation when the primary vitreous forms, and then around the 20th week, it's supposed to start to regress. And when there is this failure, then we'll have this uh, persistent um, hyperplastic primary vitreous, which would be seen as uh, a deformity along that uh, line. So in terms of the manifestation, this could be unilateral or bilateral leukocoria. Uh, a patient may have poor vision. There may be microphthalmia or strabismus. So, the aspect of regression has been said. So the consequence of the regression is that this would lead to fibrosis and several abnormalities, which we shall look at in subsequent um, uh, slides. So in 90 to about 98% of the cases, uh, this would be uh, unilateral, but uh, bilateral is also in according to uh, literature. So these patients will usually have uh, cataracts, and on clinical exam, this may, it may be difficult to make a diagnosis of PHPV. So ultrasound is actually a modality of choice that is, would enable us to evaluate the vitreous chamber despite uh, having the cataract. So in terms of the incidences, we see that uh, in the United States, about 5% of all cases of blindness are actually related to PHPV. And in another study that was done in China, uh, which was a pilot study, about 0.3% of the cases of, for every 15,000 uh, newborns, 0.35% actually had uh, this condition, so which makes it uh, quite uh, rare. In terms of the classification, it basically you have the anterior and the posterior, in which the anterior, the abnormality would be in front of the origin of vitreous, which remains integrated within the capsule. So usually this would be seen. Uh, in terms of imaging, according to some studies that have been done on MRI, you would find that the anterior chamber would be uh, uh, small and clinically this would present as microthermia. You may find uh, remnants of the uh, iris vasculature and then there could be lens or opacity. Whereas in the posterior one, there's a vascular stock that would arise from the optic nerve uh, radiating in all directions and uh, it could reach the retina where you have the retinal folds, but at times it is also attached to the uh, optic uh, nerve uh, vascular band, and this may also come with um, the anterior anomalies. So on this image, what we are uh, seeing here, actually, this is a picture that is uh, showing us a, a typical example of a case of the mixed uh, features which is not uh, anterior or posterior, but uh, a combined one where they are in involvement of the anterior chamber. So if you see the anterior chamber will look smaller, then there is elongated cilia process, and then there's a progressive um, cataract as well as the posterior features. But on this one where you're only seeing the posterior features, you can see that there's tractional uh, retinal detachment that can be observed within that and in the region of the uh, retinal folds. So in terms of our case presentation, this is a female three months old born. 
SVD with an APCA of 9-10-10, RFVD and exposed with a periorbital swelling and leukocoia on right uh, uh, eye. So the concern from the ophthalmologist was a possible retinoblastoma or congenital cataract. So prior history was that the child was treated for common cold at two months and this treatment was vitamin C allergics and uh, paracetamol. So when we speak about leukocoria, uh, leukocoria is actually um, can be broken down into two, leuco to imply white, chorea uh, as in um, uh, uh, opacity. So the white opacity here is what you see when you shine light onto the iris what you'd need to see is a reddish color. And then the moment you have a whitish reflection, then you know that, I mean, this becomes a case of leukocoria. And what is leukocoria associated with? It may be associated with a retinal detachment of either retinopathy of prematurity or in the cases of uh, uh, trauma, but it can also be seen in cases of persistent hyperplastic posterior uh, vitreous, we see it also in cases of uh, retinoblastoma in other infections such as uveitis and as well as the case of congenital uh, cataract. So in terms of the examination, this procedure was explained to the mother. There was no sedation given, uh, primarily because uh, of um, uh, usually it is best to attempt to do an examination without sedation. So that is actually current uh, practice only if the patient would be unstable. And unfortunately on this particular day, uh, there was no uh, pediatrician available for, you know, like uh, uh, to administer the sedation. So the machine, uh, as always, it's, it, it's a mind ray DCN3. We use the linear probe, the one with a smaller footprint of 14 megahertz. This primary is to fit the uh, eye socket because if you have a larger footprint probe, it could actually be resting between the glabella and the outer canthus of the eye. So a smaller footprint fits nicely within the socket. So both eyes were examined in grayscale and with color Doppler sin loops and still images were obtained. So the initial imaging that you can see here um, uh, shows uh, a stalk that is arising from the optic bundle uh, posterior extending towards the lens. If you can see on this image, the lens appears uh, uh, thickened, but posterior you cannot appreciate any tractional uh, folds as as yet. Then on this color Doppler image, which is actually very critical because in some cases where the, the stock is small and the vessels are thin, you may not actually obtain a color Doppler signal within it. But in this case, we were able to demonstrate that. And then at some point, which was consistent with an arterial flow. So here, let me just share um, a small thin loop of the exam. Uh, yes, yeah, so we can see the thick, uh, the thick band uh, there, and if you can see, the lens appears uh, uh, thickened in keeping with uh, um, a cataract uh, formation. So these were uh, the color Doppler images and the same loop. So in terms of the ultrasound findings, and this is uh, backed by literature, there is an echogenic band in the posterior segment of the globe that is extending from the um, uh, optic disc at the point of the um, uh, optic nerve bundle uh, and extending posteriorly to the um, posterior aspect of the lens that showed features of um, a cataract. So the cogenic band was uh, fixed with the eye movement. Then the, cat the lens, as I say, it was thickened and echogenic in keeping with the congenital cataract. There was no evidence of uh, traction or retinal detachment at this point. The left eye was uh, uh, seen uh, normal. So in terms of the discussion here, the stock which we saw can be fixed to the optic nerve papilla like we saw 
and then attached as well as to the posterior capsule of the lens. And this is what we actually saw in our case. So when the abnormal vascular is fixed to the lens, it leads to fibrosis and cataracts. And that's exactly what we're able to demonstrate that there's actually a cataract uh, formation. But when it is attached to the posterior wall, you can actually have um, a tractional retinal detachment. So it is important to uh, evaluate the presence of uh, retinal or uh, vitreous uh, detachment uh, if it's a posterior pH uh, uh, P, PV. So when we look at um, uh, other things that we need to be very mindful of is the arterial flow, which I mentioned that in cases where the thickness of these vessels is uh, small, you may not actually be able to demonstrate um, any colored within that um, within the stock. So it is very important that when you are assessing, you exclude a possible uh, retinoblastoma. This is really important because you should be looking for a calcified mass posterior to exclude um, a retinoblastoma because that could be also uh, one of the findings. So in terms of CT, usually when you do CT, you'll be looking to find for a soft tissue replacement in the vitreous body. There can be a retrolent soft tissue along the cloclet canal. Then the um, absence of any abnormal calcification within the orbit, because if there is abnormal calcification, then you're beginning to think of a retinal blastoma. So the globe may be small, then you would see retrohyaloid layered blood. There could be hypervasculite of vitreous um, uh, humor in which when you give um, contrast, uh, you'd find that uh, there is a, a marked uh, um, a contrast uh, uptake that would actually be able to demonstrate a retinal detachment uh, posterior. So these, the retinal detachments can appear as hyperdense uh, on uh, CT. So in terms of patient uh, management, the patient was referred back to the ophthalmologist. And then out of interest for those that would want in terms of uh, management of cases of uh, uh, persistent primary vitreous. These include lensectomy, posterior vitrectomy, a retinal photocoagulation, and uh, intraocular implantation uh, or silicon oil tamponade. But the, uh, some um, clinicians or uh, surgeons actually do not recommend surgery for the posterior, posterior uh, uh, I mean, for posterior persistent uh, primary vitreous uh, because they feel that a conservative uh, management is actually more appropriate. But uh, of late, there have been a, a new advances in terms of uh, uh, management of these cases. So purely this is uh, at the discretion of the uh, uh, ophthalmologist in terms of uh, uh, what uh, can be um, done, but the overall aim is to maintain uh, good uh, eyesight. So that is uh, what we're looking at in terms of management. So these are actually my references for this uh, presentation. And as always, Africa brings something new until we meet again in the next presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in.